On a spring morning in 2010, a young man walked up to a 7-Eleven convenience store in Oklahoma City. Rather than going inside, he instead headed for one of the store's three payphones on the building's exterior, where he would make a brief call. Though this conversation lasted less than a minute, when it was over, the man was incredibly relieved. He had been in a pretty desperate situation, but now he had been assured that it was over, and as a result, all of his problems were going to be solved. The only thing he had to do now was sit tight for a bit. However, as hours passed that day and the man continued to stand around waiting with no further updates, it became increasingly clear that something was wrong. He desperately phoned back the number from that morning, but call after call went to voicemail. That's when it slowly dawned on him. Everything he had been promised was a lie. Late that afternoon, this man would make one final call from that bank of payphones. Shortly after he did, he was surrounded by police. If there's one thing that everyone agreed about 50-year-old Louis Louis Fryer, it's that he was the kind of guy who went all in on the things that mattered to him in life. He could give you a dissertation on anything related to sports, especially University of Oklahoma football. He took pride in his ability to tell a story, and he could spend hours giving you the ins and outs of why he preferred modified float tubes over boats when it came to bass fishing. Yes, you could say that Louis was a man of many interests, but at the top of this list, there was always something that trumped everything else, being a dad. Louis's journey into fatherhood began in the early 1990s, after he met a woman named Trisha Wheeler. By all accounts, it was a real opposites attract situation. He was known for being more quiet and measured, while Trisha had a big personality and was very outgoing. Still, the couple quickly fell in love and got married. By 1994, they had welcomed two children into the world, a son named Keith and a daughter named Kaylee. They moved into a modest house in the city of Guthrie, located about 40 miles north of downtown Oklahoma City. For a while, the young family was incredibly happy. Louis had a good job working for a high-end picture framing business, where he was directly involved in designing the company's products. Trisha, meanwhile, was a stay-at-home mom for her two kids. Unfortunately, things wouldn't remain that way forever. While Louis continued to thrive both at home and at work, the same couldn't be said for Trisha. After developing a drug habit, she struggled with addiction, and soon ran into legal troubles as well. Because of drugs and weapons convictions, Trisha was in and out of prison for a lot of the early years of her kids' lives. Deciding he didn't want his children to be around all of that, Louis asked for a divorce. It was finalized in 1997, after which Louis got full custody of Keith and Kaylee. Though single fatherhood had its obvious challenges, Louis did his best to keep everyone happy and healthy. According to those that knew him, he put an immense amount of effort into making sure he was there for both of his kids regardless of his obligations at work. He made the most of every bit of time he had with them, whether that was during car rides to school every day or through sharing his love of football and fishing. By 2010, it appeared that all of this had been worth it. Keith was almost finished high school and Kaylee was halfway through. In a couple of years, it looked like Louis would be an empty nester. Maybe he'd spend his newfound time with his bass fishing club or on one of his other many neglected hobbies. Sadly, Louis would never get the chance to experience this next chapter of his life. Or any other for that matter. You see, Unbeknownst to him, at that very moment, he was at the center of a chilling plot. One with a disturbing hidden motive that he never could have imagined. Nine one one. Uh, my dad's dead. Hey, where's this at? My house. There's blood everywhere. I can't go in there. What's your dad's name? Louis Fryer. He didn't wake me up in the morning. His car's gone. Everything's gone. Hey, is there blood? You said there's blood everywhere? Yes, there's blood all over the floor. I tried to wake him up, but he didn't wake up. I have him in route, okay? Yes. Gotta stay calm, okay? Uh, I've never seen a dead body before. 
The 911 call you just heard was placed at 7 o'clock in the morning on May 13th, 2010. It was made by Louis Fryer's 15-year-old daughter, Kaylee, who was completely frantic. Through tears, she explained that she had just stumbled across a horrifying scene in her father's bedroom. He was lying on the floor, unresponsive, and there was blood everywhere. She was worried that he might be dead. When officers from the Guthrie Police Department arrived at the scene, they found Kaylee hunched over and sobbing on the porch. She said that she was pretty sure her dad was the only other person inside, but since police didn't know what they were walking into, they entered the property with their weapons drawn and proceeded to do a detailed sweep of the house. It turned out that Kaylee was right. The only other person inside the residence was her dad, Louis Fryer. The 15-year-old's worst fears had also been correct. Tragically, the 50-year-old father was dead. Louis Fryer was found in the master bedroom lying face down on the floor next to the left side of his bed. His body was tangled in the sheets and comforter of the bedding, which were covering most of him with the exception of his upper back, head, and feet. The rest of the room was also in an obvious state of disarray. Based on Louis's injuries and the blood evidence, there was no question that he had been the victim of a brutal attack. His body was surrounded by a pool of blood on the carpet, and there was more of it in various places around the room. The most significant of this evidence was the blood on the exposed mattress of the bed, which suggested that Louis might have been attacked in his sleep. The actual cause of Louis's death was multiple stab wounds to his back and both sides of his neck. It would later be determined that the injuries to his neck in particular would have been quickly fatal, which also explained the amount of blood at the scene. Injuries to the 50-year-old's hands heartbreakingly suggested that he had fought for his life. Based on the severity of the crime, Guthrie police contacted the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation for assistance with the case. At the same time, investigators turned their attention to the only potential witness they had so far, Kaylee Fryer. Because of how understandably distraught she was, after finding the 15-year-old at the crime scene, police had temporarily taken her to one of their cruisers to get her away from the house. Due to her age and the trauma she had just experienced, detectives tried to limit their questions, though they did ask her if she could tell them anything she could remember about the lead-up to the crime. Kaylee said that as far as she was aware, she really hadn't seen or heard much. The previous night, she and her dad had watched a movie together, and afterwards, they had both gone to bed at around 10.30 p.m. From that point on, Kaylee said she had been fast asleep. In fact, when she woke up on her own just before 7 a.m. that morning, it was the first sign that something was wrong. Her dad usually woke her up for school, but that morning the house was eerily quiet. When she had gone looking for him, she had encountered the disturbing crime scene and called 911. When asked if she knew any reason why someone might want to hurt her father, Kaylee said no. The only thing she could think of was that maybe it had been a robbery. As she had mentioned during the 911 call, her dad's white Buick Century was missing from its usual spot on the driveway. This information piqued the interest of detectives, whose first inclination had also been that the crime could have been a robbery gone wrong especially after they discovered that Louis Fryer's wallet and a cup full of change that he usually kept next to his bed were missing. They theorized that perhaps the perpetrator had broken in and had been in the process of stealing several of the 50-year-old's valuables when he woke up. A struggle ensued, during which Louis was killed. A search of the rest of the house initially didn't seem to support or disprove this theory one way or the other. There were no signs of forced entry anywhere at the residence, though one window was found slightly open and could have conceivably been used to get inside. The only thing investigators were confident of was that the killer had escaped out the back door after the murder. This was because of blood smears which were found exclusively on the inside of the back door. However, detectives' thoughts about the case started to shift when they made another discovery in the kitchen. A single knife was missing from a butcher block that was sitting on the counter. To them, this seemed inconsistent with a robbery gone wrong. It now looked like whoever had done this had deliberately armed themselves before heading into Louis's bedroom. Perhaps their intent had been to kill him all along. If that were the case, though, 
The question became, who would have done something like this? And what was their motive? Investigators thought they might have their answer when they learned that Louis had a second child, one who was suspiciously absent from the house that morning. About two hours into the school day on May 13th, 2010, there was a knock at the door of a classroom at Guthrie High School. When the teacher opened up, they were greeted by a group of police officers who stated that they needed to speak with 18-year-old Keith Fryer immediately. The senior went with the officers as requested and was walked to the school's main office. Unbeknownst to him, it wasn't his principal waiting there. It was agents from the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation and they had quite a few questions. You see, back at the crime scene, detectives had received one more potentially useful piece of information from Kaylee. She told them that just three days before the murder, her dad had kicked her brother Keith out of the house. Upon being informed of the awful tragedy that had taken place, Keith instantly became emotional. He threw a chair, yelled, and briefly stormed out of the office, accusing the OSBI agents of lying to him. However, he eventually calmed down enough to the point where authorities were able to ask him some questions. First and foremost, what had happened three days earlier between him and his father? Keith stated that the whole thing had been about a fight at school, something that he had had problems with in the past. This time, though, the consequences were more severe. His dad had a rule. If he got into trouble for fighting once he turned 18, he would have to find another place to live. And that's exactly what had happened. For the past couple of days, Keith had been staying with friends. While the 18-year-old admitted that tempers flared at the time, he claimed he hadn't been holding a grudge against his father, certainly not the kind that would have led him to do something like this. In fact, Keith said that being kicked out was more of a tough love thing than any sort of serious feud between them. He knew this because literally the day that he left the house, his dad apparently checked up on him through one of his best friends. Louis had lunch with the friend, during which he apparently admitted he was going to let Keith come home as soon as he showed that he had smartened up. Tragically, Keith said he and his dad were on the verge of patching things up, but now they would never get that chance. Police weren't simply going to take Keith at his word, so they asked him if he could provide them with an alibi for the previous 24 hours. He gave them the information of some friends who he said could vouch for his whereabouts specifically during the time frame when the murder took place. Authorities immediately followed up on this, and it seemed that Keith's alibi checked out. With Keith now looking more like a tragic victim of circumstance rather than a serious suspect, Investigators began asking him similar questions to the ones that they had asked his sister. Was there anyone that he could think of that might want to hurt his dad? Or was there any other motive behind the crime that they might be missing? Much like Kaylee, the 18-year-old said that there wasn't really anything like that that he was aware of. As far as he knew, his father didn't have any enemies. However, Keith did tip authorities off to something potentially interesting. He mentioned his parents' divorce as well as the fact that his mother, Tricia, had been in and out of prison over the years. By this point, detectives had already been trying to reach Tricia Wheeler, especially because she was now the legal guardian of her 15-year-old daughter, and they needed her present before they could ask Kaylee any more questions. However, the revelation about Tricia's criminal history added a new potential vector to the case. Could she have somehow been involved? Though multiple calls to Trisha initially went unanswered, she eventually showed up at the police station in Guthrie on her own out of the blue. She said that her phone had been dead, but that luckily she had only been about an hour's drive away in Oklahoma City. She stated that she came right over as soon as she heard about what had happened. After agreeing to undergo questioning, Trisha denied any involvement in what had happened. She said that yes, her and Louie had gone through a divorce but that was more than a decade ago at this point. She stated that she never would have hurt the father of her children, nor did she have any reason to. Detectives asked Trisha about the custody situation between her and Louis, probing to see if this was a potential motive. However, she claimed that if anything, her ex-husband was more generous with her than he needed to be. Despite being granted full custody, 
Louis let Trisha see the kids far more than what was legally ordered, especially as they had gotten older. A lot of times, Keith and Kaylee would spend the weekends with her. It wasn't every weekend, but it was enough that she was a constant presence in their lives. Detectives weren't sure what to think, but Trisha provided an alibi which they began looking into. In the meantime, they were able to ask Kaylee some more questions now that her mom could sit in with her. Investigators asked Kaylee if she could provide them with the names of any other people who might have had access to her family's house. Was there anyone else that had a key or someone who might have been a frequent visitor? She told police that no one like that came to mind. Her dad didn't normally like to have people over at the house. The interview went on like this for a while, though unfortunately, it didn't appear that Kaylee had much more that she could provide. Investigators were further stumped when they received confirmation that Trisha Wheeler's alibi had checked out as well. It looked like they were back to square one. Luckily for investigators, the situation wouldn't stay that way for long. As it turned out, one small tip was about to snowball into a series of startling revelations. Around the same time the detectives were hitting a dead end in their questioning of Trisha Wheeler down at the local police station, OSBI agents and other investigators from the Guthrie PD were looking for any new leads they could find back at the crime scene. In particular, they had started canvassing the area, speaking with neighbors and others that knew the family, and asking if they had seen anything suspicious around the time of Louis Fryer's murder. At first, this process was fairly frustrating. It appeared that no one had seen anything out of the ordinary the previous night. However, the tactic would pay off when investigators received some very interesting insights about the Friar home. The information came from two friends of the person who up until now had been the star witness in the case, 15-year-old Kaylee. It turned out that Kaylee had been rather selective about the information that she had given to police. For example, though she brought up her brother Keith's problems with their dad about fighting, she failed to mention that she had actually gotten in trouble for the exact same thing. If anything, her situation was worse. She had been kicked out of the same school three times for fighting. In fact, it had been a while since the 15-year-old had been to school at all. According to Kaylee's friends, for the last little while, her dad had been trying to rein in her reckless behavior by becoming increasingly strict about her social life. This had backfired, though, as Kaylee had not only despised this, she had gotten around his rules by simply going behind his back. She was drinking, using drugs, and having people over at the house without Louis's knowledge. All of it happened while he was at work. Since Kaylee wasn't in school, she was at home doing whatever she wanted during the day. By far, the biggest secret that Kaylee was keeping from her dad, though, was about the relationship she was in. For the last several months, she had been dating a 21-year-old man named Jerry J. Childs. The friends told police that Kaylee was well aware that her dad never would have approved of her relationship. Jay didn't exactly have a lot going for him. He didn't have a job, he wasn't in school, and he was also basically homeless after having been kicked out of his own house as well as another place where he had been staying with friends. Of course, all of this was sort of beside the point because there was a much more obvious issue, the six year age gap between Jay and Kaylee. I should also point out that the age of consent in Oklahoma is 16. So technically, the relationship wasn't even legal. Despite all of this, Kaylee's friends explained that she had been sneaking Jay in and out of her house for some time. They also told investigators one more thing. Three days ago, Louie had found out about what was going on. It was actually Keith who had spilled the beans when he was getting kicked out. The friends didn't know all the details, but they were pretty sure that Louie had confronted Jay in their neighborhood shortly after learning about all of this. He told him that he was too old for Kaylee and that he didn't want him seeing her anymore. Understandably, these were bombshell revelations, ones that detectives realized could very well be related to Louis's murder. With that, they began searching for Jay Childs and released an all-points bulletin as a part of an effort to track him down. 
No sooner had this APB been released than authorities received another update about the case. Louis' missing Buick Century had been found on a dead-end street in the community of Valleybrook, about 40 miles south of the crime scene. Officers rushed to the area and were able to secure the vehicle, which was taken in for processing. Understandably, there were high hopes that it might offer crucial insights into the murder, especially since it had almost certainly been driven by the perpetrator. Unfortunately, this would not be the case. Aside from the car keys, which were found in the center console, there was little of note inside, and none of the items taken from the Friar home were recovered. This isn't to say that the vehicle was a complete letdown, though. In fact, it was about to become a major piece of circumstantial evidence. Late in the afternoon on May 13, 2010, Guthrie police received a call from a young woman named Sarah Kester. She said that she had information concerning the whereabouts of her friend, Jay Childs. Jay had just called her crying and begging for a ride, saying that he was stranded in Oklahoma City. Specifically, he was at the Crossroads Mall, less than a mile away from the place where Louis Fryer's abandoned Buick had been found. Minutes later, at around 5 p.m., Jay was surrounded by police in the parking lot of the mall and agreed to come in for questioning. After sitting down in an interview room, detectives confronted Jay about what they knew so far. He vehemently denied having anything to do with Louis's murder and said that his proximity to the car was a complete coincidence. He claimed that the real reason he had been stranded was that he had been hanging out with friends and that they had kicked him out of their vehicle. Understandably, Investigators had a hard time believing this and began pressing Jay for further details. When they did, he quickly changed his story. Jay now admitted that he had been secretly staying at the Friar house for the past few nights. Kaylee had been letting him in after her dad went to sleep and he had been sneaking out before Louis woke up. He claimed that it was all going fine until they had been caught. Jay stated that just like usual, Kaylee had let him in the previous evening and they had made their way to her bedroom. They must have made too much noise or something, he said, because not long after, they heard footsteps coming down the hallway. Seconds later, he said Louis had burst inside, and after realizing what was going on, had flown into a rage. Jay said that he ran for it, but before he could make it out of the house, Louis had cornered him with a golf club in the kitchen. That's when he had grabbed a knife from the butcher's block and fought back. He didn't want to hurt Louis, he said. It was self-defense. Immediately, detectives knew that this story couldn't be true. For starters, the blood evidence didn't show any sign of a struggle anywhere other than Louis's bedroom. On top of this, the only golf clubs in the house were in Louis's bedroom closet, the same closet that Louis's feet were blocking where he had fallen after being stabbed to death. There was just no way he could have used one of these clubs during the struggle. When pressed on these inconsistencies, Jay changed his story again. He now admitted that he had gone into the Friar house that night with the intention of robbing Louis. However, he still claimed that the killing had been an accident. While grabbing valuables from the 50-year-old's bedroom, Jay said he woke up. He said he stabbed Louis to death in a panic. While detectives felt that Jay was getting closer to telling them what had really happened, there was still one thing that didn't make sense. If the point was just to rob Louis, why had Jay grabbed a knife from the kitchen before going into his bedroom? Seemingly having no clear answer for this and realizing that he wasn't going to be able to lie his way out of the situation, Jay finally conceded. He said that he was ready to tell the truth. What he told investigators next was nothing short of horrifying. Jay explained that for the last several weeks, Kaylee had been trying to convince him to murder her father. She told him that she couldn't live under his rules anymore, and she was sick of him trying to control her life. She wanted to live with her mom, who she said would let her do what she wanted. At first, Jay said he told Kaylee there was no way he was going to do that, especially since when he asked for specifics about why her home life was so unbearable, all she could come up with was that her dad was mean and that he forced her to do laundry and chores. 
However, Jay said the situation changed a couple of days ago when Kaylee gave him some completely unexpected news. She told him that she was pregnant. She also said that there was no way her dad was ever going to let them be together or keep the baby. If they wanted to be a family, their only hope was moving in with her mom. And the only way that was going to happen was if Louie was out of the picture. With everything laid out like this, Jay said he finally relented. And when Keith got kicked out of the house temporarily, he explained that Kaylee saw a perfect opportunity to carry out their plan without having to worry about potential witnesses. At around 3 a.m. that morning, Jay stated that he snuck in through the back door of the Friar home, which Kaylee had left unlocked for him. He then grabbed a kitchen knife from the butcher block where she had shown him and headed down the hall towards Louis's room. Jay explained that even after making his way inside, he almost didn't go through with the murder. At one point, he actually turned around and started walking away, but he eventually convinced himself to go back. He stood at the foot of Louis's bed, knife in hand, trying to work up the nerve. In the end, it was panic that had motivated him to act. He saw Louis's arm move, and thinking he was awake, Jay said he just started swinging the blade. He stated that he and Louis had struggled, but the surprise of the attack had given him the edge. Louis was too badly hurt to fight back and had fallen over onto the floor. His last words were, help me. After Louis was dead, Jay said that he grabbed his wallet, car keys, and the cup of change from his bedside table and ran out the back door, leaving behind the bloodstains. He took Louis's car from the driveway and started heading towards Oklahoma City, throwing the murder weapon and the 50-year-old's wallet out the window on the way. He dumped the vehicle in Valley Brook, where it had later been found. Just before 7 a.m., Jay said that he had walked over to a 7-Eleven convenience store near the Crossroads Mall. He called Kaylee from a payphone, telling her that he had gotten rid of all the evidence. One minute later, Kaylee had called 911 pretending she had just stumbled across the crime scene. Jay said that for the next few hours after that, he had waited for Kaylee and her mom to come and pick him up. He thought that they were going to start their new life together, but they never came. Needless to say, detectives were stunned by Jay's confession. He was arrested immediately afterwards. Kaylee was taken into custody a short time later. Both of them were charged with first-degree murder. Understandably, no one wanted to believe that Kaylee could be responsible for such a heinous crime, particularly those closest to her. Investigators were having similar reservations. Given how much he had lied, could they really believe what Jay Childs was telling them? As they continued to unearth new evidence, though, it increasingly began to back up what the 21-year-old had claimed. For starters, there were Kaylee's phone records, which not only verified the timeline exactly as Jay had laid it out, but contradicted the 15-year-old's original version of events. Despite what she had told police about sleeping through the night, the records showed that Kaylee had checked her voicemail and accessed the internet around 3.30 a.m., right after the murder had taken place. Next, there was the additional forensic examination on Louis's body, which suggested that it had been moved at least slightly after his death. The only person who would have been in the house at that point was Kaylee. Again, she had originally claimed she never went all the way into her father's bedroom. Perhaps the most damning evidence suggesting Kaylee was the mastermind, though, came from her MySpace page as well as a journal found in her bedroom. In both places, investigators found disturbing writings that expressed how much she hated her father. Her MySpace profile read in part, quote, The story of my life is complicated. My mom, she's the most important thing in my life. If anyone knows me real well, they'd know that I'd do anything for her. My dad, on the other hand, I could care less what happens to him. He means nothing to me. As chilling as all of this already was, there was one final nail in the coffin, so to speak, that would arguably prove to be the most consequential of all. After being taken into custody, authorities would get access to recorded phone conversations of Kaylee while in jail. In conversations with her mother, she reportedly made it clear that she had never actually been pregnant. Also, 
that she had never intended for Jay to actually come and live with them. After being informed that he had been completely manipulated into doing what Kaylee wanted, Jay agreed to plead guilty to first-degree murder, as well as testify against her. In exchange, prosecutors agreed to request that he receive life with parole rather than life without parole during sentencing. Nearly one year to the day after Louis Fryer's murder, his daughter went on trial for the killing. And due to the severity of the crime, she was tried as an adult. During the proceedings, Kaylee's defense did their best to highlight the age gap between her and Jay, suggesting that it was therefore obvious who was really responsible for what had happened. They portrayed her as an innocent teen who had gotten caught up in the schemes of an older man. Their theory of the case was that Jay was actually the one who wanted Louis dead. The reason, they argued, was that when he found out Kaylee might be pregnant, he feared that he would go to prison due to the fact that she was underage. Interestingly, they pointed to the fact that this wasn't the first time Jay had gotten involved with a younger girl. Three years earlier, he had actually married a 16-year-old, though in that case he was also only 18, so the age gap wasn't nearly as consequential. Still, they pointed out that about six months after the marriage, the teen had gone on to file a protective order against Jay. Ultimately, though, the jury was more convinced by the prosecution's story, especially when they presented their evidence along with Jay's testimony. When it was all over, Kaylee Fryer was found guilty of first-degree murder. She was also sentenced to life with parole. A life sentence is considered to be 45 years in Oklahoma, and first-degree murder is an 85% crime. So with that in mind, it means that the earliest that Jay and Kaylee will be eligible for parole is sometime in the late 2040s. Perhaps unsurprisingly, a lot of the stuff that we came across while researching this story focused on who was more responsible for Louis Fryer's murder, Kaylee or Jay. I think you could make a convincing case for either one, and I'm interested to hear all of your thoughts in the comments below. But I ultimately think it's sort of beside the point. Louis Fryer was a beloved father, son, friend, and so much more. And at the end of the day, his life was stolen from him over basically nothing. What I find particularly haunting is the thought that in his final moments, when he was calling out for help in the dark, he had no idea that one of the two people he loved most in the world was responsible for what was happening to him. While I think that Kaylee and Jay both deserve to be where they are right now, at the same time, I think it's worth pointing out that there's a second layer of tragedy to this whole situation. And that's that two young people also threw their lives away in the process of committing this heinous crime. All that being said, I think it's important to try and find some semblance of redemption in these stories wherever possible. And in this case, I think that's in the undeniable love that Louis showed for both of his children. As Keith said in an interview that we came across, he thinks that his dad would have forgiven Kaylee despite what she did. And ultimately, that's how he wants him to be remembered. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you'd consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, Thanks so much, everyone, and take care.